To test what he does have, Phillips travels to California, to the labs of Parker Hannifin, where the rudder control unit is made. The curious metal chips floating in the PCU's chambers are dismissed. Phillips is told that filters keep them out of the delicate servo valve that directs fluid and moves the rudder. Nothing else is found that could explain any sudden movement of the rudder on flight 585. We didn't have any absolute indication or information that we could point to that said the rudder, power control unit, the servo valve, or any, any part of that flight control system caused that accident. Phillips still suspects a mechanical problem, but with no conclusive evidence that the PCU or servo valve caused the crash, he's forced to sign off on the tests. It's a pass. For only the fourth time in its history, the NTSB releases a report which doesn't reach a conclusion. The cause of the crash of Flight 585 is undetermined. We had put a lot of time and effort in, into the investigation, and we just weren't sure what had happened. It was like he was tracking a serial killer. He was frustrated that they had not solved 585. He did not want that to happen again. But almost two years after the report on 585 is released, the killer strikes again. At 7 p.m. on a clear, windless day, U.S. Air Flight 427 is nearing Pittsburgh. Captain Peter Germano and First Officer Chuck Emmett are getting ready for their final approach. As they close in on the airport, the pilots are on the lookout for another flight about 10 kilometers ahead of them. Looking for the traffic. Turning 100. Zero, zero. U.S. Air 427. I see the jet stream. As they pass through the turbulence Whoa. left behind by the other flight, their jet suddenly and alarmingly rolls left. Oh. Hold on, hold on. Hold on, shoot! Nothing the pilots do seems to have any effect. There's no hope for the 132 passengers and crew. The human carnage is so bad, authorities declare the crash site a biohazard. With the help of eyewitnesses, information from the flight data recorder and the cockpit voice recorder, investigators begin to quickly see some striking similarities between 427 and the unsolved case of United 585. In fact, they seem to be mirror images of each other. On final approach, United 585 rolls right, while US Air 427 rolls to the left. Oh God, slip. Hang on, hang on. Both crews are caught by surprise, and after just a few terrifying seconds, both aircraft plummet straight into the ground. Certainly the whole team was aware of the previous accident with United 585 in Colorado Springs. We try to keep that in the back of our minds and take a look at this one as to what it presents to us. Miraculously, much of US Air 427's tail and rudder appear intact. The hydraulic devices inside the tail have also sustained very little damage. Phillips and Houter prepare to send the parts to the manufacturer, Parker Hannafin, for testing as soon as possible. They need answers. 
pressure on the NTSB to solve the accident is growing quickly. We couldn't live with the fact as investigators of having two unsolved 737 accidents. The airplane is in too much use, too wide a use around the world. It carries too many people every day. Unsolved was not an acceptable answer. If 427 was an undetermined accident, we could not find the cause of this accident, there was a great chance that if there, was a, if there was a third accident with the 737 fleet under similar circumstances, that the 737 fleet would have been grounded. But the investigation's primary suspect is the dual servo valve, part of the power control unit that moves the 737's rudder and a suspect in the crash of United 585. Parker Hannafin made the valve. At its lab in California, investigators look inside the main cavity of the U.S. Air Power Control Unit. Just like in the earlier crash, they find tiny chips of metal floating in the hydraulic fluid. But once again, Parker and Boeing repeat their claim. Filters designed to stop any debris from interfering with the delicate metal slides have done their job. Investigator Greg Phillips wants to be absolutely sure. If the chips were blocking the slides, they would have left tiny scratch marks behind where they rubbed against the metal. But Phillips can't find any. Another pass. Okay. Once again, the investigators are forced to shift their focus back to the pilots. By studying the plane's flight data recorder, investigators know that the jet's rudder was deployed fully to one side, what's called rudder hardover. We were definitely focused on a rudder, on, on hardover rudder, uh, full rudder uh, input for about 20 seconds. It can be caused either by hardware, something unknown in the hardware, or it can be caused by pilot input. First officer Chuck Emmett, who was flying 427, did indeed step down hard on his rudder and then held it there while the plane plummeted towards the earth. It raised a grisly question. Was he trying to fly the plane into the ground? What the hell is this? Human performance specialist Malcolm Brenner listens closely for evidence on the cockpit voice recorder. What the in this case, they had microphones right by their mouths, and you can hear as well as in real life or better, you can hear uh, breathing sounds. Mm. Yeah, I see the jet stream. The cockpit recordings indicate that Flight 427's troubles began at the moment it flew through the jet wake of a Delta Airlines 727 that had just passed in front of them. Both pilots are startled by the wake. I see the jet stream. First officer breaks off at the end of a sentence. I, I see the jet stream, so, and there's no more discussion of the jet stream or anything else. They both focus. Something happened here. Captain says, "She's." Hmm. It was such a smooth flight that it was a momentary jolt that they just hadn't anticipated, and with that, uh, the pilots got on the controls and immediately, you know, put in a rudder input. The cockpit recorder even records the thumping sound of the jet stream turbulence as 427 flies through it. As Flight 427 encounters the turbulence, Brenner hears something unusual. First Officer Emmett begins to grunt. The grunting is unusual. Uh, the controls are designed so that pilots don't need to grunt. They're specially designed around human capabilities. So to have someone grunting is typically a sign of an emergency. By matching data from the flight recorder with the crew's voices, Brenner is able to confirm that Emmett's grunts begin a split second after he pushed down on the rudder pedal, and three to four seconds after the wake turbulence affected Flight 427. What the Go hell? On their own, the cockpit voice recordings prove very little. But it seems clear that the crew weren't trying to crash their plane. Something happened which took them by surprise. They reacted as quickly as they could, but nothing they did seemed to help. What the hell? 